Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark from the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the chamber, I would like to welcome you to our webinar this morning, Data Literacy 101. I would like to begin by thanking our sponsors. Our presenting sponsors today are Science Is Us, the Maine University of Maine system. Our webinar series sponsors are AARP, Central Maine Power, Delta Dental, First Light, Kennebec Savings Bank, and Sun Life. Just a couple of administrative things about this call. We are recording it, so if you have to leave early and want to catch up, you can do that by checking in on our website later for the recording. We brought you all in by mute in so that we could reduce the background noise. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or type your question in the chat room. And if there is any reason why you would not want your name to be associated with your question or comment, you can... Uh, text it to me directly, Mark Ellis, and I'll be happy to relay that onto the panel. Um, a copy of the meeting materials that you see today will be also made available on our website. And if you have any problems with your connection, please just uh, try to re reconnect using the same link. If all else fails, reboot. <laughs> so it is my great pleasure now to introduce uh, to you the President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, Patrick Woodcock. Good morning, Patrick. Well, good morning, Mark, and thank you for all of the participants and uh, listeners today for joining this, uh, which is a one-on-one assessment of data, which is just fundamental to good public policy making. I just want to thank Science Is Us and the University of Maine system for partnering on the content today. Uh, this would not be possible uh, without their leadership. When I think about data um, and public policy, I think it's important that uh, very rarely are we receiving the exact uh, report or study, it, but rather a summary of that information in legislative committees, in regulatory proceedings. And it's usually unweighted in terms of information of who is presenting it. The individual presents uh, select aspects of the data. And it's usually with a person who has a specific agenda before the legislature, before state government. And it's very important for policymakers to be able to recognize how to utilize that information and, and be able to unwind that data for empirical implications of the public policymaking. Uh, I previously worked in energy policy, and that was constantly an issue of utilizing data by individuals that have a financial interest that could be manipulated. And it's very important to be able to understand that that aspect is always occurring and for policymakers to try to cut through with, uh, with understanding data on its, on its most empirical level. I do want to uh, uh, turn uh, to Rachel Carestes, who is with Science Is Us, and want to thank, uh, again, Science Is Us and the University of Maine system for partnering on this content today. Rachel. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Patrick said, I'm Executive Director of Science Is Us. Um, Science Is Us is actually a nationwide initiative. We are a collaboration among seven science and engineering societies. So uh, our member organizations represent individual scientists and engineers. And we know, just as Patrick said, that trying to parse through the science, the evidence, the data, all of the technical information, particularly that individual scientists and engineers put together, is really difficult. And it's difficult in honesty and fairness, it's difficult for scientists and engineers to do that too, right? So asking folks who, who are perhaps outside of those communities to an, analyze and interpret that data is, that's a lot to ask of folks and we recognize that. So at Science Is Us, we've developed a number of tools, some of which you'll see throughout the course of this webinar, but you can find them on our website and they'll be available in the uh, materials packet that Mark referenced as well. But really what we hope you'll get out of today's conversation is just some high level tips and tricks 
ways to understand if the information that's being presented to you is something that you can trust. Is this coming from a credible source? Does this represent what we call the consensus view, right? So if if everyone is here and in agreement and there may be an outlier, where do you put your trust? Well, we tend to argue as scientists to put your trust where the consensus is because that represents lots of research, lots of study, lots of questioning. So we, we're really looking forward to the conversation today and we hope that we have the opportunity to continue this conversation. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Sarah Gill. Thank you. Can everyone see my slides? Quick thumbs up. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, everyone, um, for taking the time to be uh, with us this morning. My name is Sarah Krishals Gone. I am a senior research associate at the Cutler Institute for Health and Social Policy at the University of Southern Maine. Um, and I direct a team called the Data Innovation Project. And we were founded in 2016 to build the data-informed capacity of Maine's mission-driven organizations. We do that by providing accessible technical assistance, training, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and resources to those mission-driven organizations around Maine. Uh, we carefully chose the word mission-driven. Uh, typically, we work with nonprofits, but we also have worked with state agencies, municipalities, and a number of other organizations that have uh, some sort of mission towards improving the well-being of Mainers. So my hope for today, similar to what you've heard from the other uh, uh, other preventer, uh, presenters so far, my hope for today is that you leave with a deeper understanding of the complexity of data and research, um, that some sources of information are more credible than others. And I also hope you leave with some of those simple techniques and tools that can help you to increase your data savvy and when in doubt, feel free to give uh, all of these experts a shout, uh, reach out. I know a number of us are, are happy to field questions that might be coming uh, from the field and from all sorts of different individuals. So I wanna give a couple definitions. Um, so defining data can be a little bit difficult, um, but at its essence, data are just pieces of information. Individual facts are, or statistics that when pulled together help us to find meaning. Data can be the basis of reasoning or calculations. It can be the recorded factual material and observations uh, commonly accepted in the scientific community or the social science research community to validate our research findings. Data come in many shapes and sizes. We have primary research, which is field research, and that involves collecting and gathering new information that hasn't been collected before. So for example, surveys or questionnaires or interviews or focus groups with people. Secondary research, sometimes called desk research, involves gathering existing data that's already been produced. So this might be from a surveillance survey, from various reports, or even extracts from um, agencies, administrative data from a record keeping system. Data can be both qualitative, meaning words that are reviewed and themed, or quantitative, meaning the how many's and how much is, which can then be analyzed to produce counts and statistics, percentages, rates, ratios, and all of that. Now, data nerds, and I fondly include myself in that categorization, Data nerds have lots of thoughts about how to best gather and interpret information and what conclusions we can draw. And our pedantic academic discussions can often lose the average data consumer. But I'd really like us all to focus on that second aspect, that regardless of those discussions about methods and how we are capturing information, cred credible resources are transparent about what they have done and how. So as a non-researcher or numbers cruncher, there's a lot of information out there and it can be very overwhelming. So how do we know that the sources we're using to inform our decisions are reliable and sound? I've tried to break it down into a couple guiding questions. So five good questions to ask. And of course, this might vary a little bit depending on the type or source or resource that you are looking at. But no matter what, you always ask who is the funder of the research? Who is the source? I am highly suspicious of any source or research that doesn't include this information. What is the research or resource trying to answer? What was their question? And how are they doing that? 
how many people, how many observations, how many sources were included in this product? And what are the, how are those sources being used? And remember, there's strength in numbers, that consensus, the more numbers indicate stronger results. And it's always good to think, are there other ways to explain these findings? Are there things that the study was unable to address or did not take into account? So these are five really good guiding questions when you're looking at a resource to ask yourself and to think about um, as you're moving through the various things that we're presented with. And as Rachel said, Consensus is really important. If many studies are drawing similar conclusions or many different sources of information are pointing to the same conclusion, that claim is stronger. All signs point to yes. So these are some green flags to look for. The funding source and the researcher or authors are clearly stated. The same goes for the methods and information sources used in a study or to produce a summary. And this could be in a footnote, a list of references, an appendix, a methods section linked to a website with that information. I don't care where it lives, but it needs to be clearly noted and it needs to live somewhere. The secondary data sources should be credible ones. The US Census, a high quality survey that's used in multiple studies, a peer reviewed article. And lastly, a green flag is a resource that transparently lists its biases, its flaws, or its limitations. Now I'm going to talk through some of the red flags that you should also be aware of. It's easy when looking at data to treat it as reality rather than information collected about reality. And we take what's said as pure fact, which can lead us to drawing the very, some very wrong conclusions. But unless a survey or data collection is really rigorous, has a lot of responses, or has reached out to a lot of different people, and often in many different ways, we can't always make such lofty claims. So here's some examples of language to watch out for. This is how the public feels about our topic versus this is how the people in our focus group or in our survey were willing to say that they feel. The second example is a more reputable source because they're not trying to claim too much from the data that they have. Um, there, are, These are the barriers to services. Again, that would raise a little bit of a red flag to me, and I would want to deep, dig deeper into that claim versus these are the barriers identified by survey respondents or focus group participants. So it's not necessarily that those statements are completely um, red flags, but you want to dig a little deeper. So you might want to go and ask yourself, what are some of the numbers behind this claim? So here's something we see all the time, rate increases. Enrollment increased by 50%, holy cow. But if you don't know the underlying numbers, that can be a misleading claim because here we can see that an increase of five people in the first instance is the same as an increase of 75 in the second because of how the math works. And this works in reverse as well. A very small increase for something that is starting out pretty big can actually be fairly impactful in terms of raw numbers. So this is an area where you want to always dig a little bit deeper. Another example of this is when you see a survey result and people focus on a very small change, say maybe a difference of 30% for one group compared to 30%, 32% for another. Depending on the source, that might not actually be important at all. So you want to ask, well, what's that plus or minus range that we see almost often on public opinion polls? And I think a generally good rule is to focus on differences that are more than five percentage points and dig deeper um, for those smaller differences. So depending on that source, those smaller differences might be important, but you want to check. Another one. Causation means one thing causes another. In other words, action A causes outcome B. On the other hand, correlation is simply a relationship where action A relates to action B, but one event doesn't necessarily cause the other to happen. So in my example, I can easily claim that 100% of students who complete our DIP uh, Applied Research Fellowship are employed afterwards. But that doesn't mean that our fellowship is the cause of that employment. Now, I will say that although only 20 students have completed our fellowship over the past few years, five of the 10 alumni who completed an interview with us said they felt their experience helped them get their current job. So we th certainly think we are contributing to employment, but we can't claim to be the cause. Another red flag 
is a study or a resource that lacks important context or neglects to include key facts. So here is an example. And this, these are real quotes from a study um, that was completed at the Institute a few years ago. Our interpretation and meaning of these statements changes dramatically when I add just that one small piece of context, who said what. Another critical piece of context is the comparative one, benchmarks. Uh, here, I can say that this person's height is six feet and two inches. But is that tall compared to what or whom? A national average for men or women compared to children 100 years ago? Uh, comparison is one of the simplest ways for us to make sense out of data and information. So when there are no comparisons, Again, I say dig a little deeper. It may be uh, a, a qualified and legitimate piece of information, but that comparative context can really help you dig deeper into um, a, a better understanding of the information being presented to you. Ah, and there's my, my fun animation there to, to uh, illustrate that point. So to wrap up, there are a few resources that I want to share with you about this topic because I'm sure we all have more questions. Um, so first of all, as Rachel said, Science Is Us has a really simple checklist and some other tools that can help uh, uh, you and remind yourself of these tips and tricks. So that's that first link and these will be going out after um, the presentation today. Um, our data innovation project on our website, we host a data scan. Uh, we're really focused on health and social policy, so communities and people, health, education, and economy. And we keep a scan of reputable data sources that are relevant to the work uh, of organizations in Maine that are accessible and free. We've already scanned them. We've determined that they are reputable. You can search them for various search terms for different levels of geographic impact and different uh, population groups. Um, so that's up and it's on our website um, for free, uh, free use. Um, and if there's a source out there that someone thinks should be included, uh, give us an email. We're always updating and double checking our links to make sure that everything's working um, and we're adding in new sources. Lastly, uh, there is a new report out uh, that I didn't produce, uh, but I was on the advisory board. It was pulled together by the United Ways of Maine. Um, it's a report about the real economic hardship facing many Mainers that goes above and beyond uh, the federal poverty level calculation. It's called United for Alice. They did a state-based report. They have um, state and county level um, estimates of what it really takes uh, to live in the state of Maine, and it's a great resource, and I'm just trying to give it a shout out in as many places as I can. Um, so with that, that's my time. Thank you so much for yours. Uh, please reach out with any questions at any time. I like to practice data am amnesty. No question is too small. Um, and um, again, thank you. I think Andy is next. I'm just queuing up my slides, apologies. Um, okay, can everyone see those? Perfect, thank you, Sarah, I saw the thumbs up, so I'm gonna take that as it's good. Um, thank you everyone uh, uh, for the opportunity to present today. My name is Dr. Andrew Crawley, I'm an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Maine. I also am Director of the state's EDA University Center. Um, have a number of other different roles. But but today, um, I'm really pleased to be able to talk about something which is one of the questions I get asked an awful lot about um, by practitioners, um, by policymakers, by businesses in general. And that's building off of some of the work Sarah was talking about, how we understand and measure the labor force and trying to understand the differences in uh, different measures that you're gonna see out there and put into the public. Um, so I, I decided the best way to begin this, like Sarah was describing, I kind of want to pull in reality. Last week, a very big federal study that, that's released every month, the Labor Force Survey was released and lots of different news stories got released. So the first one was talking about November's unemployment rate falls to this level. 
Another story talks about teen, un teen unemployment spiking and the potential dangers to the labor force. Another report talks about the stagnant labor force. They are all, all based on the same data that was released. This isn't different points in time. This isn't different uh, 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 kind of different uh, periods across a pandemic or something. These are the exact same data that was released by the feds. So what's going on here? Well, the first thing I wanted to do to make sure that everyone is on the same page, all of those statements I just put up from very reputable news sources, they are factual statements. Every single one of those statements was correct. In fact, I want to build off of one thing Sarah said. If you did your check to make sure that where is the data coming from, most of it was coming from the exact same surveys. Either it's some business survey or the household survey, census, or other kind of federal data. This has been peer-reviewed, checked, and checked by thousands of analysts. So the data is coming from the same place, and it's a pretty reputable source. The problem is that when we talk about the labor force, you can cut it and measure it in many different ways. And so what I'm going to do in my talk today is just highlight some of these elements in my 10 minute segment, some of the issues and challenges around this. And I think the biggest takeaway that I want to give at the end of this, depending on what piece of the labor market you're looking at, it's measuring very different things. Therefore, you can come to very different conclusions based on what definition or what variable it is you are looking at. So to begin with, you hear a lot about the total labor force. Well, the total labor force is made up of people that are unemployed as well as employed. So there's unemployed and employed. And I think a lot of people think when we say labor force, it means everyone is working. In fact, that is not the case, because if you don't fit into being unemployed or employed, you're not in the labor force. Now, what that means, there's one key term here, and that's the unemployed piece. And so let me leap ahead a little bit. Employed, according to the federal government, according to official economic statistics and data, employed are paid employees, self-employed, and really, really important, unpaid family business workers. They are employed people. And another assumption that people make, ah, oh, well, if we have high unemployment, that means wages, more money. People might not be being paid but they are still classed, according to these federal surveys, as employed. The next one is such an important concept. I hammer this home to my undergraduate students because I know a lot of these individuals are going to go on into businesses who are making decisions. Unemployed are people not working, but who have been looking for work in the previous four weeks. So if you stopped looking for work five weeks ago, you weren't actively looking for a job, you no longer considered as unemployed. That is a very, very big difference than just saying unemployed. In Maine and some other northern New England states, we have very high levels of unemployment. Now, those are people who are actively looking for work. Now, the rate is very small, but it's still a large group of people. Then everyone else who doesn't fall into those two brackets is not in the labor force. They are not included in the labor force. So these definitions mean that those initial news stories that were put out, they were all absolutely factually correct, all from the same source, but they were defining and measuring things in slightly different ways. To add complexity to this picture and to try and help give a better understanding of what economists are talking about, if we take our total labor force, so that's unemployed and employed people, and we add all those that are not in the labor force together, that gives us the total population of the United States or a county um, or a census block, whatever level it is. So you see that the labor force is not one thing. It's actually made up of different components. And by defining them slightly differently, you get a different picture of what's going on. Another term that appeared 
in those news stories was what we call the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate is taking all those that are in the labor force, unemployed and employed, and you're dividing it by the total population. So that's in that total population, you're going to have people who are students or retired people, uh, people who are not actively engaged in the labor market. So if you see a new story quoting labor force participation, that is making no distinction between the employed and the unemployed. Now, to those of us who actively work in policy, uh, in the policy realm, and we're talking about reducing unemployment and reducing the challenges of unemployment, if you look at the labor force participation rate, you're not measuring exactly the same thing as if you want to just understand the in it, the unemployed population. And so that distinction about exactly what we're measuring and what we're looking at has profound implications from a policy point of view. This talk was about data literacy. And to me, the cornerstone of understanding the labor market in general is understanding the labor force participation rate. And then secondly, the unemployment rate. So the labor force participation rate is looking at unemployed versus uh, and employed divided by that total population. Now, the unemployment rate is only focused on the unemployed, dividing it by the labor force. In other words, if you have not been looking for work in the last four weeks, maybe you've been look you haven't looked in the last six months, you are not included in the unemployment rate. And the amount of reports and stories that often talk about this measure, but don't talk about long-term unemployed in terms of people who aren't actively looking for work. Maybe you've been discouraged from the labor market. Maybe the jobs that are in your area do not cover the skill set you have. So understanding this distinction between when we talk about the labor force participation rate and the unemployment rate, even though they are from credible sources, the same surveys, they're looking at very different things. To show you an example of just one piece of this, because there's so much of it, if you look at the labor force participation rate by county in Maine, you see vast differences between different counties. Now, we know this. There's vast differences between these areas. However, something that is not captured in this is long-term unemployed or retired population or people who are not actively looking for work. And in some of our rural counties, that presents a profound, significant challenge. So when we're talking about labor force participation, you're not capturing the total population that could exist within the respective county or within the respective subgroup that you're looking at. You're looking at one piece of a very complex puzzle. And so when you're comparing these, you need to understand that sometimes you're not comparing like with like. So unemployed is not the same as the labor force participation rate and vice versa. What I wanted to also give a plug, because Sarah mentioned about giving other resources to people. Earlier this year, and, and Sam's on this call, Sam uh, was a profound influence on developing uh, and, and, and pushing and supporting uh, the, the MIWA project, which was an initiative, a pilot initiative that was put forward um, to develop more research around labor force and workforce development uh, explicitly with the ideas committee. There's an advisory board. As part of that group, I was involved in doing some research to pull together a tool that would allow you to look at different elements of the labor force, to look at different components of that uh, labor market. And um, the results, there's a web link and these slides will be shared. I encourage every, anyone to take a look at it. It presents a figure and a formatic that you can pull on and be able to look at different components of that labor market. It's a really useful tool for anyone who wants to understand different pieces about the labor market, but you don't, but you don't aren't sure where they belong. We include everything from education all the way uh, uh, from births, different types of education structure. We have this for different industries. So people are able to understand and look at data in um, a more uh, intuitive way than sometimes is often lost just looking at surveys or news stories. So with that, I think that's my time today. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions and um, 
please feel free to, to use the link that I shared. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, and I believe that Amy and um, Ruth are up next. Good morning. How are we doing on slides? Thank you. Good morning. Yes, I'm Amy Johnson from the Maine Education Policy Research Institute, and I have co-presenting with me today, Ruth Kermish Allen. Ruth, can you go first and introduce yourself? Hello. Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth Kermish Allen, and I serve as the executive director for the Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance. And uh, the MMSA is a nonprofit organization um, based in Augusta, Maine, but we work all across the state to advance equitable access to science, technology, um, engineering, and math education for pre-K through 12 students all across the state. Um, we work with about 1,700 educators every single year year, um, which reached tens of thousands of students um, thinking about data literacy in the classroom. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, and I am Amy Johnson with the Maine Education Policy Research Institute, or MEPRI. Uh, MEPRI is an entity that actually exists in state statute as a cooperative agreement between the University of Maine system and our various state uh, government entities. So I have a, I am at the University of Southern Maine. I have a co-director, Janet Fairman, who is at the University of Maine. And together we try to support all of our state government entities uh, around areas of education policy. Most of our work is with the Legislative Education Committee on Cultural Education and Cultural Affairs. Um, and we also do work for the Maine Department of Education. But education is one of those topics that also comes up in all other areas. So we try to be an asset to any area of state government where there's a need for more data or more research. Uh, I will say, I think we're a, a well-kept secret to some of those agencies. Um, so we're, we're trying to make sure we're as, as useful as we can be. So we're here to talk about education data. Um, and the first two things we wanna just sort of put out there as context for landscape are, when you're dealing with education and public education, this is an area of huge public investment. And so there is a lot of data out there. There's a lot of administrative data that's collected for accountability purposes or information purposes on student achievement, spending, investments, grant reporting, all, all kinds of things as well as research out there. We have a lot of researchers out there, I consider myself one of them, who are um, also collecting data to try to shed light on what works in uh, education. And the second thing that I wanted to just point out for landscape is that this is an area where there's actually federal privacy laws that dictate um, data and data use in this, in this area. So one is FERPA, which is a Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And then there's also a federal uh, statute around collecting data from humans or human subjects. So these also are part of the context of, of education um, data. We're just gonna briefly talk about four issues with you here today. One is administrative education and how great it is, uh, ed education data, administrative education data and some of the challenges that come along with it. We'll talk about primary education data collection and then perhaps most importantly, leave you with some resources. So assets, administrative data, there is a lot of public data that is collected. So both um, for in people who are interested in collecting their own data as well as for researchers to build upon. So it's important, MEPRI tries as much as possible to really think expansively in our, um, our charge. So not just pre-K to 12, although that maybe is what we would say is the bulk of our work, but thinking about the whole um, span of our public education data system. And for early childhood, what we would say about that is there's really a lack of data to help us understand um, truly what's being provided, what resources are there, what's happening, what are the outcomes in the world from birth to uh, age three or four. In the world of PK to 12 education, there is such a volume of data collected for both local, state, and federal requirements that I would say it's actually too much. Oftentimes, trying to find what you're looking for can be a needle in a haystack, even for myself as a researcher. Um, there's just a lot out there. And again, it's not just data about students, it's also about systems and finances and spending. And um, there, there's a whole lot of data out there, which is both a blessing and a curse. In higher education, um, I got a question mark on this. This is maybe arguable, 
but there's um, the data that's collected both by institutions, which is almost always public, both for public institutions and private institutions. Um, there's a lot of public data, but there's also, um, I think kind of a sweet spot of, of the intended audience, I think for a lot of the public data that's pushed out there for reports from our federal sources is really consumer driven. And that makes it a little more accessible than I think some of the data for PK to 12. So depending on what area interests you the most, um, you, that's either a good news or a bad news story. And then I also wanna talk a little bit about reliability. For administrative data, um, because it is collected for other reasons and reported to these governmental agencies, it's kind of in many ways, the best you can hope for when you're looking for quantitative descriptive data to understand what's happening. It is by far not perfect, but it is good when you're looking for that quantitative administrative data um, in that it's collected at scale, it's collected universally, um, and it tends to be publicly available. Ruth has some more to say on this topic. Yeah, I think one thing that I want everyone to take note of when thinking about, especially this peak, uh, pre-K through 12 administrative data, is that the way that it is collected, of course, is very defined and specific. But the resources that each school, each town, each state has to be able to gather that data is a excessively wide continuum. So for example, um, a local school that has a very small school budget, um, maybe sometimes within that town that school struggles to pass their school budget, they are not gonna have, um, the, that might be one tiny sliver, the data collection may be one tiny sliver of another teacher's job that they do on the side of their desk as they're available, or the superintendent does it. Um, in other school districts, it could be that there's a person or at least a half a person devoted to collecting that data and reporting that data. When we look across other states, um, many other states have mandates that each district must have a data collection person uh, uh, on their payroll to really focus on collecting this data. So thinking about whether we're comparing a school to a school, a district to another district within our own state, or state data at scale compared to another state's data at scale, just please keep in mind that the way that that data is collected, the amount of resources available to each school to showcase what they're able to do with that data is very, very variant. And I would say um, implicit in what Ruth is saying is that that also may be different in Maine than in, than in other states um, with, with comparing the state to state. And another related uh, implication for Maine as a rural state is our small N challenge when we're looking at administrative data. So because of our privacy laws, because of just prudent practice, when you have small numbers of cases trying to represent a group, you want to treat those with care because you want you don't want to you, you don't want to reveal data that implicitly could reveal who who the data is. So the uh, classic example um, in assessment data that I like to talk about is English learners, uh, multilingual learners. So this is obviously an area of real relevance, both from a policy perspective as well as our community perspectives, as we want to know how students who are multilingual learners are are faring, how they're doing. When we look at achievement data on multilingual learners, achievement data is presented by school, by grade level, and then disaggregated by things like um, race, ethnicity, and multilingual learners. Well, in 99% of the school districts in Maine, there aren't more than five multilingual learners in a given grade, in a given school. Even in our big districts, um, outside of Portland and Lewiston, even Auburn and Augusta might be sometimes challenged to meet these minimum thresholds. Uh, so those data points, if they don't reach that minimum threshold are suppressed. So it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you good, it doesn't tell you bad, it tells you star. So one of the things that happens a lot in Maine and other rural states is trying to look at the public data sources that are available um, will only tell you so much of the story. So that's um, challenge number one in Maine. We come across this all the time. And what that, what that also means is that as researchers, we're often not able to use public reports because of suppressed data. We have to try to get source data, which is another logistical barrier. So challenge number two is finding the right report or source data. As I already have touched upon, there's just a lot out there. And so this is where um, 
oftentimes the kind of things that can be most useful to non-researchers, to the community, to policymakers, is finding something that already exists that's come from the right broker. And so this is an area where in education, I would say taking the things that Sarah talked about earlier and really applying those concepts to the organization that you're using to get your data from is a really helpful practice. So yes, you wanna look at the actual specific report, but a lot of times looking at that pre-level of whose report are you reading, where who's it being filtered by, um, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations that produce helpful reports in this area, as well as researchers like myself, as well as you know academic researchers at universities. So doing some analysis and some thought onto where is this coming from, I think is a little extra important in education where that's actually, um, we have these think tanks and groups that are, that are aggregators of a lot of data and reports. Yeah. Ruth, did you have more to say about that? Yeah, and I'm just going to say, like, I, I'm moving on to, I think, our next slide, because I know we're tight on time. MMSA specifically, you know, our focus area is on STEM education. So thinking about knowing that quantitative data or the data for the numbers or this um, these large data sets that are collected at scale is only going to be a part of the picture for what's happening in Maine schools and what, for example, we really care about what's happening for the educators across Maine. So we oftentimes use a mixed method approach, which is also taking into um, account the qualitative data. So what it, I um, would be very, very careful to look when you're looking at a report, is it numbers only without any stories or context for how those numbers were gathered or for the um, context within which that um, information was gathered, for example, what kinds of classroom or what kinds of budget they might have. Um, so thinking about this um, in the context of, adding surveys, interviews, focus groups, they really provide us with that context of, is this information coming from um, a school where maybe they only have, for example, I used to teach at North Haven, Community, North Haven Community School, where the entire high school had 20 students, and I taught all of the math and all the sciences. Or is that the same information compared with Portland Public High School, where they have hundreds of kids within that context and a wide variety of differences? So taking uh, understanding the cultural context um, of uh, where that data is coming from can give you a much better sense of what's actually happening across the board. Uh, again, how do we know whether it's um, the data gathered from a very, very small community or very large? Uh, what is happening within our very rural districts is really important, but oftentimes that voice is not elevated strongly enough to really shout the story of what's happening in our rural context because they have such a small sample size compared to much, much larger districts. Um, and thinking about the different forms of um, classrooms, the different kinds of preparations that our educators have. One thing I think to be really um, thoughtful about when thinking about data literacy within um, education is, of course, where is that information coming from? And how has that teacher also been trained to think about it as well, or the person gathering that data trained about it? Um, across the, the research that Maine Math and Science Alliance does, we do a wide variety of this mixed method research where we are also getting our um, human subject protections. These, a lot of that's coming from the National Science Foundation to gather interview data from teachers, understand what's happening in the classroom, doing observations on that classroom in concert with qualitative data about and quantitative data about how students um, are doing uh, in the classroom. And back to you, Amy. And what the one thing I would just add on to that is that this, this need to require um, human subjects review whenever collecting data from specific individuals, be they teachers or students, uh, is especially acute with um, the fact that anyone under the age of 18 is not considered able to give their own consent. So researchers just through time and resource constraints have um, additional hurdles to try to get data and get devices directly from students, even high school students. So this is where in education landscape world, um, I think many of us would say researchers, we would love to get more student voices, more direct primary data from our students themselves. Um, but that's an area that's really a little too filtered. And oftentimes we have to talk to teachers, talk to the adults, talk to the parents to try to get those perceptions. And I think that's a challenge um, when looking at that contextual um, 
survey interview focus group kind of education data. It's certainly a challenge and and there is still um, some out there as well. So I think, you know, just look around for, for what kinds of access to data that there is. And then lastly, we want to leave you with our resources. Uh, so the first I want to offer up myself and our organization, MEPRI, mepri.main.edu is where we have publicly presented all of our reports to the legislature um, as in other audiences that are that are paid for with public dollars. Um, again, we, as long as we remain a well-kept secret, we have the time and resources, a piece of, a piece of my time is paid for by public tax dollars. Uh, we're happy to be available and to help you know, be a sounding board for, hey, does this research look credible? Um, to point in the right direction of maybe some organizations that might be might be a good shopping area for the kind of information you're looking for. We're happy to be a research to leaders and policymakers across the state. Um, Ruth, I'll let you talk about. Thanks so much, Amy. Yeah, so MMSA, um, where we are doing federally funded um, research and professional learning uh, design for STEM education, uh, which is great because we have this educator practice component of what we do, reaching with ed- reaching out to educators and working with educators. And we also have this arm within the organization of research and evaluation. So um, I myself am an education researcher. We have a whole um, team of educational researchers as well that are looking at, okay, what is working really well within these different strategies and contexts and what is going to then be scalable across the board. Uh, We also partner with many organizations across the state like the Ecology School, um, Teachers in Space, um, and many others that are looking at what is the actual impact of the STEM education that I'm doing? What are my teachers learning? What are their their students learning around STEM career awareness or understanding? And that's where we come in and can provide them um, with surveys and um, different tools to get down to really understand understand um, that kind of impact. I will also say we have a number of landscape analyses as well around specific STEM content areas, um, like, for example, outdoor learning and environmental learning. Um, We're also working closely with the University of Maine, the Department of Education to think about uh, computer science landscape analyses as well. So those specific kinds of context areas, those reports are are available and growing. Um, And one last thing that I'll just say um, is that I was just down um, at uh, the Harvard Data Science Initiative presenting on data literacy in the classroom actually last week with Northeastern um, Institute for Experiential AI. And those of you that have businesses that relate to artificial intelligence, um, that idea of data literacy in the classroom and how people work with data, how they understand it and what they use it for, especially how it's fed into artificial intelligence models is a topic that is really becoming very interesting across um, the corporate sector and workforce sector that um, certainly thinking about what's needed in the classroom and what educators need is going to be um, of of very strong importance. So thank you so much, everybody. Look forward to hearing more. And then the other organizations on this list, just briefly, we wanted to make sure we also gave a shout out to Educate Maine. This is an organization that has its roots in um, an effort to compile data, uh, educational scorecards, indicators of success. So they they are um, a nice balanced resource that really is targeted at informing our main stakeholders. Uh, Nationally, we have ECS, which is Education Commission of the States. They tend to have a a nice sweet spot of informed audience. And so their their work is accessible, but also, um, you know, it's it's detailed enough that you can get what you need out of it if you're an informed audience, but it's not so in the weeds that it's, it's a huge time investment. And NCES is the National Center for Education Statistics, which is a goldmine for direct data. Sarah, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Ruth, um, for all of those resources. And whew, um, what a lot to say in in such a short amount of time. I think next up, we have Damien. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, I was going to start by saying now for something completely different, but I think um, actually a bunch of the themes that were mentioned uh, earlier today about uh, data literacy um, definitely apply to uh, coastal environmental data. So um, I'm going to share screen. And I'll do the obligatory thumbs up if you can see my slides. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Damian Brady. I'm at the University of Maine in the School of Marine Sciences, and I work out of the Darling Marine Center in Walpole, Maine. I'm going to be talking about environmental data literacy, but specifically, my area of interest is the coast. Um, and you know, more broadly speaking, 
my focus has really been on the blue economy. So whether that's um, offshore wind development, aquaculture, or fisheries. Um, so we'll try to, I think, cover a lot of ground in about 12 minutes. Um, but uh, I am very, very happy to discuss um, how data gets used in the decision-making context for these three buckets of the, of the you know, quote unquote, blue economy. But um, been working on uh, um, offshore wind um, as the University of Maine's offshore uh, environmental monitoring lead since about 2009. Uh, we direct an aquaculture experimental station at the Darling Marine Center, and we, we run a coastal water quality lab. Um, and then we work, uh, as, as any marine scientist in the state of Maine is contractually obligated to work on lobster if you're here. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, how we use data in those three contexts. Um, so I, I wanted to start with lobster just because so many of these other interactions interact with this with this fishery. And um, some of the points that were made earlier uh, by my colleagues are, you know, are applicable here, right? That you can report on the lobster industry in lots of different ways, right? Um, and clearly, because uh, um, it's an interaction between price and and supply, uh, the how much we're landing, you often see lots of different reports, right? So you can either determine that the aquacol that the lobster industry is extremely healthy. Um, this is data I'm taking from the Maine Department of uh, Marine Resources. They have a harvest page. I encourage you if you are, if you're in coastal. Uh, counties and districts, um, the main Department of Marine Resources landings page is really, really incredibly useful, but this is right from the Department of Marine Resources. You know, one thing to think about with our lobster industry is that landings peaked in 2016, have been sort of declining ever since. Um, but, you know, as, especially given what Andrew said, you know, compared to what, we're still at, um, uh, in terms of metric tons, we're still near 100 million tons. And if you compare that to 1995, um, when we were, uh, you know, a much smaller fishery, we're 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 in pretty good shape. So the question is, is this a uh, is this a decline that we expect to continue? A lot of our surveys dictate yes. And recently, the um, uh, the state of Maine and the Atlantic Maine, uh, Marine Fisheries Commission has decided to increase the minimum size to keep more reproductive lobsters in the population. Um, uh, on the flip side, of course, two years ago, and or in, rather in 2021, we had the the um, uh, largest landing landed value ever at 730 million dollars. So the price tanked between 2021 and 2022, and even though the landings are similar, it tells a very different story uh, about this fishery. Uh, as I was going through the landings page of the Department of Marine Resources, I just wanted to also point out that things are changing very, very rapidly. So over the course of one year, we went from $730 million to $388 million. Um, so a couple of hundred million dollars left the lobster fishery over the course of one year. Many people are surprised to hear that the American eel fishery or the glass eel fishery or elver fishery is actually our second largest fishery at $20 million. Um, so there's a precipitous decline after American lobster. And I, you know, I, I would challenge most people to think that the American eel fishery was our second largest fishery. I also wanted to point out that if you've never heard of Atlantic Menhaden, it's our fourth largest fishery in the state of Maine, and it was non-existent three years ago. <laughs> um, and if you are familiar with Atlantic herring as our primary species for the bait fishery in Maine, that's only $1.8 million. Um, so that fishery has essentially... Um, disappeared. And we have a new fishery in the state of Maine, really, for the Atlantic Menhaden fishery. And I, I point this out here, because if you're not familiar with the Atlantic Menhaden fishery, it has skyrocketed over the last three or four years. So if you think you know the coast, I just encourage you to, to hang out on the uh, Department of Marine Resources Harvest Landing page, because there, there's a lot of stories about how quickly the, the coast is changing. So I, I'm, I'm going to um, briefly do a shout out. A lot of the research we do here at the University of Maine develops models and observing resources so we can understand the coast. Um, I won't get too far down this road, but one of them that is uh, on a umaine.edu slash coastal sat, we have coastal satellite images of the state of Maine. This is turbidity or the amount of sediment or dirt that's coming off the landscape into our water. Here's an April image of the Kennebec. So if you're familiar, this is the Kennebec River. This is the Demerscotta River estuary, the Sheepscot. Um, this is after an April image. You'll see a massive amount of dirt and uh, um, sediment coming out of the Kennebec River, a, a lot less coming out of the Androscoggin. It comes down here through the Kennebec estuary, creates a plume, and that plume comes around the corner into Casco Bay. 
Um, these are 20 to 30 meter resolution. So, uh, you know, 60 feet, 60 foot pixels now that we get every 16 days and a new satellite coming in every five days. And those are only four years old worth of images. Here's a September image um, when we don't have rain and we don't uh, um, have anything um, happening in that way. So this is my cheap style of animation. Um, just to demonstrate that we're getting unprecedented pictures of the environment now. And, and so the, the data deluge that we heard about in labor and in, in uh, education is also happening here. But it's also giving us amazing pictures of what the state is happening from day to day. So one thing I wanted to do was sort of go through uh, a day in my life as a, as, a, as a scientist in the state and the data sources that I look for when we're trying to make decisions. Um, probably the most common one that I think a lot of people go to to try to understand what's happening in the state is the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. Um, these are maps for data and ocean planning uh, in the Northeast. Uh, it's a great website for lots of different reasons, but you know, one of them is that they vet those sources um, and they answer a lot of the questions that Sarah brought up earlier about who funded it, what are the caveats with this data, what questions was that data trying to answer. Um, so I just wanted to walk through some of the things that I do when I'm looking at data um, along the coast. So the first one I'm going to hit on is offshore wind and energy and infrastructure. Um, what's useful about this view of the um, is that it summarizes everything that's been happening in the Gulf of Maine in map form so everyone can sort of keep up. This blue area is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's um, uh, draft call area. This is the initial area where they were looking at putting draft call areas for the Gulf of Maine. Um, and if I zoom in here, um, if you're not familiar with all of the things that are happening in the Gulf of Maine, uh, this is the new draft call area. So this big green area right here is pretty much where we think there's going to be some leases that go up for auction next year in the Gulf of Maine. So that's a huge, huge data source. And just notice, by the way, that these are not really near the state of Maine. And in fact, if I scroll down here, the areas that are um, near the uh, uh, near the coast of Maine are secondary area A, secondary area B. Um, so these are this blue uh, polygon and this red polygon. So these are areas that are potentially on the table uh, um, for, and that BOEM is considering right now. But this gives you an idea of these are potentially areas that could be developed. Um, they seem unlikely uh, compared to this green area, but just giving you a sense of where that is. If you're not familiar with all the things that are happening in the Gulf of Maine, this map does that too. So if you zoom in, this is the area of interest for the Maine State Research Lease where the state of Maine was an applicant for a research scale lease. Um, and then after the Department of Marine Resources did a lot of interviews with a lot of different people, this uh, became the narrowed area of interest where the, um, the PUC is considering right now a Maine research array or MIRA um, uh, uh, power purchase agreement. All of the wind areas are on this map. So this is the Monhegan project. So the University of Maine uh, is still attempting to develop a, a small one turbine project uh, off of Monhegan Island, for instance, that would connect potentially in Booth Bay over here. Uh, and in fact, it still highlights the, the areas in 2008 that the state put uh, as potential areas for development, including near Demers Cove Island and Boone Island. These are all sites that um, potentially could be developed in the future. So I'm going to move to commercial fisheries because there is a ton of commercial fisheries data that got used to designate these areas. And it's not a coincidence that some of these green areas, the shape that they look in is essentially in direct contrast to the um, areas that you're seeing here as thought of as highly fished. Um, I want to be sure that I also mentioned, because Sarah did a really good job of talking about some of the caveats that need to be on data um, one of the things that they do here in the Nash Northeast uh, Ocean Data Portal, right, is they say the maps do not necessarily distinguish between fishing activity, vessel transit, and other vessel activities, because these are all vessel monitoring systems or VMS. They're showing you the pathway of boats, but not necessarily when guys are fishing or when fishermen are fishing. Um, so it is really a map of, sometimes it's just simply a map of transit. And then what's nice about it is you can look at multi-species. So multi-species ground fish assemblages, most of it coming from Maine, coming out of Portland, for instance. Um, the scallop fishery, right, which is really on Georgia's bank, for instance. And But there are some, uh, some travelers out of New Hampshire, um, as well as some out of Maine um, in our nearshore dayboat scallop industry. 
Uh, so I, I bring this up also because I think it's really important for those of us that maybe aren't familiar with with um, data along the coast here is that you will see the elephant in the room here is that there's no tab here that says lobster fishing. And that's because lobster vessels don't have vessel management or uh, monitoring systems or VMS. They have now they have vessel trip reports. And by this time next year, we'll have data as granular as we have, let's say, for monkfish. Uh, for the American lobster, which is by far the largest fishery in the um, uh, in the Northeast, right? So um, it is only very, very recently that the that we'll have data like we're seeing right here for the lobster fishery. Um, uh, there's some really great uh, um, uh, resources here, but one of them is this interactive map um, that is that essentially goes into great detail as as to how uh, the the they set the BOEM draft call areas and all the data that got used to identify an area of relatively low use by the fishery as well as wildlife. I'll skip over to a couple of other data and data caveats. This is the marine mammal life uh, and habitat. I just wanted to highlight that this is a map that shows a model, right? So this is, it takes all the sightings that they have and the passive acoustic monitoring and models where we think we have high cetacean activity. Um, so it's not a, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that areas that have a lot of relief, which is to say that the, the bathymetry changes very, very quickly along here in Georgia's bank. Um, uh, similarly here, you have very, very deep water uh, moving into the Gulf of Maine for the first time. And so that's deep water that comes to the surface. That's deep water that comes to the surface. These are areas where the model says it's likely that you're going to see whales because whales are attractive to the production that happens when the water comes to the surface. But these aren't actual sightings, right? This is a model that says this is the most likely places where we're going to see North Atlantic right whale. It doesn't mean that, you know, we'll go out there today and see a North Atlantic right whale, for instance, right? Or, or any other cetacean. Um, I wanted to move uh, towards another great resource. If you're interested in aquaculture, there is the Maine Department of Marine Resources aquaculture map. Uh, there's a sense, of course, that aquaculture is expanding along the coast. This map uh, will go into any of uh, the estuaries and coasts along the coast of Maine and show you where every lease is in the state. It's an extremely um, easy to use tool. And um, really gives you a huge amount of information about what's happening in terms of aquaculture development. I'll zoom in here. This is where I am here at the at the Darling Marine Center, if you're not familiar. And if I really zoom in, I can even show you that the University of Maine at the Darling Marine Center has their own lease. And so I can click on the aquaculture lease. It tells me who has the lease, who I can contact about it. And then it tells me everything about what species are permitted to grow at that site. Um, so I find this an extremely useful tool when I'm thinking about marine spatial planning and um, and, and people along the coast. The and last and thing- I wanna give you one time check. We're all right about at time, so. Yeah, okay. I am, and I am Great. all done. I was just gonna add that um, the last piece of aquaculture are recirculating aquaculture systems. I know they're con you know sort of controversial in the state right now, Kingfish, Maine, Whole Oceans, and Nordic being one of the, the big players. DEP has some great information um, on there. And as part of DEP's uh, um, ongoing work, um, we collect water quality, for instance, at these sites and then measure the water quality over time. And so this is Chandler Bay and all those reports are also public and online. So always happy to talk about fisheries, offshore wind and aquaculture and where to find the best data for, for all of that information. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating. And now I want to go find all of those sources that you were just sharing. Um, and then last but not least is my wonderful colleague, uh, Kim Snow, to talk to us uh, and close us out. Great. Um, thanks, Sarah. Uh, again, I'm Kimberly Snow. I'm a senior research associate here at the Katherine Cutler Institute at USM. Um, I'm also the co-director of CAPRA, which is a, a new consortium for aging policy research and analysis. It's a partnership between uh, the Catherine Cutler Institute a Disability and Aging Program and the UMaine Center on Aging. And I'm, uh, I was tasked with, with talking about public health data, but I, I like aging data, so that's what you're going to hear about. And I'm just going to um, jump right in to sharing some data sources online. I think we've heard a lot about the, you know, the do's and don'ts of, of what you want to look for in a data source, so I'm just going to jump right in and share my screen. So let's see. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of public health data online. Um, 
I'm going to focus on main data uh, and walk you through some of these, these websites um, that I find useful, the main CDC data and reports page, and then also the UMass Boston uh, Elder Index. So first, the, the CDC data and reports page. If you haven't looked around here, I highly recommend it. It's a bit of a rabbit hole, um, but you can always get your bearings on this landing page. It has a lot of these great helpful links about the different reports that they produce, um, This uh, the main shared uh, community health needs assessment. You can get information on infectious diseases. You can get some environmental data, vital statistics, uh, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, um, uh, that is pronounced BRFIS. If you if you hear that, it's pronounced BRFIS. It's just something fun to say. Um, there's pregnancy risk monitoring system data. There is data on youth health and there's substance abuse and prevention data as well. I'm going to focus actually on the shared community health needs assessment um, because it has some good data on uh, older adults. Um, so the the health needs assessment, the shared health needs assessment is a collaboration between the main CDC and all of these organizations um, to conduct these statewide health assessments. And by doing it together, they can avoid duplicating uh, efforts and, and foster some collaborative partnerships. And the reports provide up-to-date health information at the state, county, urban, and subpopulation levels. And uh, it's neat because the, the the effort, you know, all these organizations working together, they're doing it for different reasons. Um, the, the nonprofit hospitals have to conduct uh, needs assessments to comply with federal uh, requirements, um, uh, uh, showing their community benefit requirement. Um, the, the, the assessments support state and local public health departments, national public health accreditation requirements. And of course, it provides valuable population health assessment data for a wide variety of organizations across Maine. So they put out a bunch of data reports and see if it chugs along here. This might be a very brief presentation if it's not going. Hmm. I'm gonna stop sharing and see if I can get it to go. Okay, crazy, but that's okay. Um, I will, I don't know why that's not going. Worked earlier, so they uh, they have these uh, health needs assessment reports. They're really well written. They're they're um, you don't have to be a data nerd in order to uh, get something out of them. Um, and now I see it's loading again. I think it might be a, a internet connection issue. So I'm just going to go back to it. Uh, the most recent report that came out is the 2022 um, state report. So it's pretty recent. One thing I did want to talk about um, uh, it, in terms of caveats when you're looking at data, especially public health data, is when was the data collected? So this is the 2022 uh, health needs assessment. And the really nice thing is that right up front, they have a statement about COVID-19. And so the data was collected during uh, 2021. So that might have an impact on the information that, that they collect and how it compares with previous years. So it's great that this um, has that, that right up front saying this could impact what you're seeing in this report. Um, the other part that uh, we've all heard about is uh, where is the methodology section? It's right here. So, you know, it's going to be a, a good, reliable source. They're going to tell you exactly how they collected the data. Um, and these uh, needs assessments have information about the general population, but then they also have these great um, subpopulations. And of course, I'm mostly interested in older adults. So I go right to that page. I'm not going to go over what this page says with you, but it's really, it's nicely written. You can get a lot out of it. You can understand what, what the key um, uh, uh, needs that are affecting older adults um, uh, in the state of Maine. Uh, particularly this one, I thought that this one was interesting. Uh, prime, one fifth of primary care visits were 30 miles or more away from the doctor's office. So that that is amazing to me. That's a, that's an important little nugget of information that I might want to come back in a little bit. Um, the other uh, source that I want to share with you is the um, Elder Index. This is the UMass Boston Elder Index. Um, it basically uh, uh, um, estimates the amount of income that a person would need, a person 65 and older would need 
um, to meet their basic needs for housing, health care, transportation, food, and, um, and miscellaneous uh, expenditures. Um, the really nice thing, it's got this nice de definition section that's going to tell you exactly where it gets the information from. I'm going to take you through exploring a little bit here. I'm going to put in Maine. I'm going to put in single person. I want to know how much it's going to cost depending on my uh, housing status and what it's going to cost if I am in poor health, what I might be expected to spend uh, monthly and annually on those expense, expenses. So then you click apply. Breaks it out here. You can see if you're renting and you're a single person in poor health, you're going to need over $2,500 a month in income. Uh, it's more if you are a homeowner with a mortgage, still paying off that mo mortgage. And it's the least if you're a homeowner without a mortgage uh, in poor health. You can scroll down here. It gives you the breakdown of annual income. So what this is um, uh, you know, telling you is what, is what is that minimum level of income that you're going to need? The one thing that is not included in these uh, expenses is long-term services and support. So if you're a person 65 and up who needs help with housekeeping, with some personal care tasks, that kind of long-term services and supports is not included in this estimate. So that's just one thing to have in the back of your head is a little, a little caveat. Um, what you can do with this data and what we have done with it is to um, combine it with some American community survey data. Uh, and uh, what that helps us do is find out how many people are at that uh, level of income. Are we, are we, um, do we have a lot of people who may or may not be able to afford their annual expenses? So I will go to page 22. So we took American community survey data um, we found out uh, of the Mainers who live alone, so the single people living alone, um, what their annual income was, what the median annual income was. So we have 27,000 for men, we have 22,000 for women. And then here we have the number of Mainers 65 and up who do live alone. So we've got uh, twice as many women uh, 65 and up are living alone. So when we combine this type of information with the information we got off the elder index, and we put that median level of income for women right there, we can see right now that that over half of the women uh, of 65 and up who are single living alone are likely not going to be able to uh, afford their uh, annual expenses. And that um, includes th that doesn't even include the annual expenses that would um, for our long term services and supports. So that's sort of a, a little a little nutshell of what you can do with just publicly available data right right at your fingertips. Um, I want to share another source. I'm going to share my screen again with a slide. Sorry. I'm wasting my time. I'm chewing it up. Okay. So I've given you the online sources. There are also, of course, university sources. And by that, I mean me. So I am tooting my own horn here. We are just in the process of finishing up a, a statewide needs assessment that we are, we've are we been conducting to inform Maine state plan on aging. It's something that's, that the state has to do every four years that outlines the needs, priorities, outcomes, and strategies of for the programs that they administer that are funded by the Older Americans Act. So things like caregiver supports, Meals on Wheels, Medicare and other insurance counseling and other services. And so we have collected both qualitative data and quantitative data to help us learn about what's really important to older Mainers as they live healthy and safely in their communities. And just to, to talk briefly about the qualitative sources, we have these you know, 64 focus group participants. We talked to 12 key informants. We had 92 folks attend listening sessions. And then the, the quantitative data that we were able to get uh, is right in this these over 3,000 um, survey responses. Um, so just to summarize our survey responses, we had 60, 45 to 54-year-old caregivers, 
Um, most responded by by the mail survey. They 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 filled it out, sent it back by mail. Some uh, filled out, uh, completed the uh, survey online. There was a little QR code that was included in in the mailed survey. And then we also have flyer pushed out to um, uh, through listservs from the Office of Aging and Disability Services listservs through the uh, area agencies on aging, um, age friendly community websites, places where uh, we thought that. Folks who are who who are caring for older adults might get some information. So 24 responded to those flyers, and then our big survey was a a, a survey, a mailed survey that was sent out uh, just using age and county criteria. Uh, we we were targeting adults ages 50, 55 and older. Um, so it's sort of that random sample. We're not just um, cherry picking who we're hearing from. We're hearing from folks all over the state. We had 2,300, over 2,300 responding um, by mail. We had uh, 156 responding to the online link that was in that mailed survey. 564 responded to a flyer. We had um, 571 of the respondents were also caregivers. So they are added to this other pool of caregivers up here. And then we had 1,700 respondents comment, write down, so some more qualitative information, write down what is important to them, what would improve uh, their lives as they age safely in their in their communities. Um, so this is just, this, this vast amount of information is going to be able to help us understand the needs and priorities of older adults, um, what's really important to them as they age. Uh, I'm not going to really share the results that we have uh, from the report right now because I don't want to get ahead of the state, but the report will be publicly available in January. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'll head back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and we are actually at time. So I just want to say thank you to all of our presenters for all of the wonderful um, uh, resources and discussion points they've had. And I would just like to uh, see if Patrick or Ra uh, Rachel have anything else they would like to say in closing. Well, thank you. Uh, that was an amazing amount of uh, data and also the, my takeaway really just how Maine has an incredible amount of resources available to us. Um, I know we're tight on time, so I won't provide very many comments here, but um, it, it really highlighted, uh, I particularly like the, the ocean data that is, um, I guess we can go and get some, some oysters and clams from the university, I guess. I wasn't aware of that. Um, and furthermore, the I, I particularly like the employment uh, discussion as that is so relevant in public policy and how uh, there are different attempts to sort of weaponize what uh, the data means for the state of the economy. So really appreciate the partnership here. And uh, we'll certainly, you, the chamber will certainly be following up uh, to utilize these resources in our public policy advocacy. And I'll just quickly thank everyone again for attending. And we've heard, as Patrick said, such wonderful information today, and there were such great resources. So I'd encourage you all to head to the website after this is over and take a look at the materials from this meeting, because I think there's a lot of really valuable resources that folks can come back to. So thank you all for attending, and thanks to the Chamber for organizing. Thank you all.